Thank you, uh, colleagues. Um, I would ask uh, members of the public who are in the gallery and departing after First Minister's questions, uh, if they could please do so quickly and quietly as we are hoping to resume our next item of business very soon, shortly indeed. Thank you very much. Okay, the next item of business is a Members' Business Debate on Motion 5082 in the name of Rhoda Grant on Fair Tax Week. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put and I would ask those members who would wish to speak in the debate to please press the request to speak buttons now and I call on Rhoda Grant to open the debate around seven minutes please Ms Grant. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'd like to start by thanking those who signed my motion allowing this debate to take place. I would also refer members to my Register of Members' Interests in that I am a member of the Co-op Party, a party that holds the fair trademark and also actively campaigns for its promotion, not just the fair trademark itself, but for the very ethos that lies behind it. The motion was lodged to mark Fair Tax Week in June this year. The debate is as pertinent today as it would have been then, possibly more so because we're facing a cost of living crisis. Many people are concerned about how they're going to afford the very basics for survival this winter. Tax is our investment in society, into the society we wish to live in. The money we pay should be invested in creating better and more caring society to provide security to our citizens. Therefore, taxation should be viewed as a positive contribution to society. The Fair Trade Mark seeks to highlight this. It seeks to recognise the companies that have paid the correct rate of tax at the correct time in the correct jurisdiction. Companies that take pride in the fact that they contribute to our collective well-being. Sadly, not every company wants to make that investment. It's estimated that shifting tax liability has led to a loss to the Exchequer that is equal to 28% of the tax collected. Income that should have been invested in the NHS and other essential services. Instead, it was offshored to boost fat cats and sharehold dividend or, uh, shareholders' dividends. It's not illegal, but it should be. The United Nations Principles for Responsible Investment State Earnings that are reliant on tax planning rather than genuine economic activity are vulnerable to changes in tax regulation and enforcement. They go on. Even if specific tax regulations are not changed, more proactive enforcement by regulators suggests that earnings risk resulting from these strategies is increasing. As countries and their tax authorities become increasingly concerned with the exploitation of loopholes in international tax frameworks and are under fiscal pressure to fund additional government programmes, the incidence of tax disputes and litigation will increase. Therefore, staking a company's future success on a strategy based on tax avoidance is not only morally wrong, it's also risky. Tax avoidance is not only a concern to governments, it's also a concern to citizens. The Institute of Business Ethics annual survey showed that 47% of respondents were concerned about corporation tax avoid avoidance. That topped the list of public concerns for nine years in a row. These findings are in line with the Fair Tax Foundation polling. The foundation found that 74% of people would rather shop with a business who are paying their fair share of tax. We in the UK can take steps to stop tax avoidance and offshoring, but we also must try and build global consensus to ensure that corporations pay their taxes where they are earned. That requires agreement between governments, and I would urge the UK government to initiate these discussions and broker a global response. However, there are things we can do in Scotland to promote the payment of fair taxation. 
The Scottish Government and the whole of the Scottish public sector procure services from the private sector. We need to use stringent procurement methods to ensure that companies pay their taxes. And this must be an essential requirement in all public contracts. We could also use that for licensing. For example, did the Scotland bidders have to show they had paid their taxes where their profits were earned? Were they required to continue to pay their fair taxes on profits made from our renewable energy? The fair tax mark allows companies who do pay their tax at the correct rate in the correct jurisdiction at the correct time to be easily identified. That accreditation can be trusted by procuring authorities, allowing them simply to ask contractors and suppliers whether, whether or not they achieve the fair tax mark. Councils across Scotland have been calling for ethical action in procurement by signing up to the Councils for Fair Tax Declaration. South Lanarkshire, Edinburgh, Midlothian, Dundee have already signed, but we need more councils to sign up as well. The public agree. 66% of people believed that the UK and Scottish governments and local councils should at least consider a company's ethics and how they pay their tax as part of the procurement process. During the pandemic, 80% of people believe that businesses benefiting from government bailouts should only have received that bailout if they had agreed to the conditions that prohibit tax avoidance. Frankly, I believe that they should not have received a bailout if they had not paid their fair share of tax in the past, given that those very taxes were what paid for that bailout. Many companies and organisations have received the Fair Tax Mark accreditation, and I want to pay tribute to them. There are those that you would expect, like the Co-op Party and Co-op Societies like ScotMid and the Co-op Group, organisations who have fair practice at their very core. The government-owned companies, such as Scottish Water, have achieved the accreditation, as have large PLCs, such as SSE, and smaller firms like Glasgow-based accountancy firm Brett Nichols Associates and North Berwick-based Gerba Caravans. It's a long list, but it's not long enough. We need to make sure that all companies that work with government at any level should attain this accreditation. Presiding officer, in conclusion, I believe we must change the culture around taxation. It should be acknowledged and valued when companies pay their fair tax in the country where they make that profit. It's fair to their workers and it's fair to customers. That payment is their investment in our society. That payment enables governments to provide the services and securities that we all require. Thank you. And we now move to uh, other speeches. I call uh, Emma Harper to be followed by Jamie Halco johnson Around four minutes, please, Ms Harper. Thank you, President Officer. I welcome the opportunity to speak in this Fair Tax Week debate and congratulate Rona, Rhoda Grant on securing it. Ms Grant has outlined the issues really, really well. Fair Tax Week is an opportunity to celebrate the companies and organisations that are proud to promote responsible tax conduct. Paying a fair share of tax is one of the principal ways businesses contribute to society, helping to fund the public services we all rely on. Championing a level playing field for businesses, Fair Tax Week allows for an opportunity to highlight the importance of fair tax principles in protecting and advancing public services here in Scotland as well as across the UK. Presiding officer, the growth of tax havens and unethical corporate tax conduct have become the subject of much debate here in Scotland, across the wider UK and across the globe. Aggressive tax avoidance negatively distorts national economies and undermines the ability of business to compete fairly, both domestically and internationally. Indeed, as an example, eight large tech companies in the UK made an estimate 9.6 billion in profit from sales to Scotland and UK customers in 2019. However, by moving money out of the UK, these companies ended up declaring a fraction of these profits into their accounts of their UK subsidi subsidiaries, radically reducing the tax liabilities. 
Amazon, eBay, Adobe, Google, Cisco, Facebook, Microsoft and Apple, they faced UK corporation tax liabilities of £297 million in 2019, putting the total amount of tax avoided by the companies in the UK at an estimated £1.5 billion in 2020, the latest year that we have figures for. Yes, I will. Katie Clark. Grateful um, to Emma Harper for giving way. Did she agree or, or did she find interesting the points that Rhoda Grant was making in relation to the Scotland contracts and trying to make sure we get transparency um, from the companies that have been awarded options to lease? And would she also agree that we need to look at companies that the Scottish Government are contracting with, such as Amazon, and should be expecting higher standards from them or not awarding um, contracts to them if they don't meet those standards. Emma Harper. I thank Ms Clark for, uh, um, for the intervention. I'm interested in how any company can be transparent in how they look at taxation and as much of the taxation powers are not uh, uh, part of what this devolved uh, settlement is about, you know, I would look to the UK government to help support any opportunity to uh, have the likes of Amazon, as you've mentioned, to declare their tax in a better, more fair mm -hmm. and, and appropriate way. Um, just going back to my speech, though, as I was talking about the, the amount of money, the £1.5 in 2020, that these companies uh, had uh, avoided paying tax, that money could have been invested in our country's infrastructure, our culture, our civic society, or indeed um, topically here to invest in the most in need with the cost of living crisis. And Rhoda Grant mentioned that also. But instead of aggressively working to tackle this issue and make companies pay, pay the fair share, we've seen the UK government spending three and a half times more chasing fraud and error in the benefit system than they spend pursuing tax dodging millionaires. The DWP is spending £510 million, vastly more, to prevent fraud and error in the benefit system and to collect more debt from people on universal credit. The DWP estimates it can claw back £3.15 billion from benefit claimants, while the HMRC estimate that £3 billion could be raised from putting additional resources into chasing tax dodgers. In 2020, the, pan the pandemic tax gap of unpaid revenues was £70 billion. It's simply astonishing that this is receiving less additional resources than social security fraud and error. I asked the Minister for a commitment that the Scottish Government, when we receive full taxation powers, which is currently reserved, will focus its efforts on working with business to ensure that they pay their fair share in tax and and that we'll, we will not spend billions to penalise the most vulnerable in society. In conclusion, presiding officer, fair taxation and specifically corporate tax is so important for investing in public services. We are, we are the thread that in, in tires, um, the thread which binds our communities together. So I thank the Fair Tax Foundation for all their hard work they do to support the companies and pay their fair share. Thank you. Thank you. I now call Jamie Halker Johnson to be followed by Carol Mock in around four minutes, please, Mr. Halker Johnson. Um, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And firstly, can I congratulate uh, Rhoda Fife uh, on uh, Rhoda Grant, sorry, on securing today's debate on Fair Tax Week. Fairness is one of the core principles of governance, and as Rhoda Grant's motion touches on, the public uh, show an overwhelming desire for taxation to be fair, for it to be applied in an even-handed way, and for businesses as well as individuals to pay their share. The Fair Tax Mark at the centre of the Fair Tax Foundation's work deals with the tax affairs of businesses and organisations. It's worth remembering that businesses operate in a competitive market. For that competition to work, there must be rules, and rules that provide a level playing field for everyone. Rules that do not distort competition or embed the position of those who are already successful. This is not to ignore the obvious interest that we all have as a parliament in gaining revenue that can be used to support public services and the spending that government undertakes. And we've seen an increased interest in cracking down on tax evasion and in the sort of aggressive avoidance activity that takes advantage of legal loopholes, constructing tax affairs in such a way as to reduce transparency. Governments across the UK have taken action. In 2013, the UK Parliament voted to support the general anti-abuse rule, sometimes referred to as the general anti-avoidance rule. In 2014, this Parliament followed, implementing a Scottish anti-avoidance rule through the Revenue Scotland and Tax Powers Act. Both are part of a package of measures which have been taken to tighten up reg tax regulation, 
while also trying to reduce the burden on those businesses and organisations who are paying. Of course, where tax liabilities arise is not precise. They often depend on self-reporting. Tax arrangements can be reasonably construed in different ways, and it's often a clear intention of tax rules to allow for exemptions and deductions to provide support to organisations or to encourage positive practices. There remain, unfortunately, many mechanisms for evasion and avoidance. However, HMRC's central measure of liabilities versus payment is the tax gap. We've seen a positive decline in the gap between what is estimated to be due and what actually ends up in the hands of the state, with stabilisation at a lower level in recent years. But this is not a definitive conclusion of the issue. Tax rules are regularly changing and the approaches taken to evade or avoid them evolve too. But the spirit of the law is, of course, not a value-neutral or necessarily objective judgment, particularly where complicated tax regimes are involved. Despite work under several governments to promote simplifications, the complexity of corporate tax remains. The ultimate decision on who is paying their fair share must be for independent bodies working on the basis of what is due. Uncertainty over such standard lies within the Fair Tax Foundation itself. Last year, Richard Murphy, who has given evidence to this party's, Parliament's committees in the past and who claims creation of the fair tax mark, resigned from the Foundation in part due to concerns about the mark's international standards. And as a broader point, I would also caution against increasing the administrative, administrative burden on procurement policy. It's good as a point of principle for the public sector to make ethical procurement decisions. But too often we have been perplexed that a small number of large suppliers to the public sector continue to secure public contracts at the expense of smaller and more local ones. Procurement reform has attempted to address this gap, but fundamentally many businesses do not feel they can compete as a result of the administrative burden and requirements placed upon them. While small businesses may have more straightforward tax arrangements, they may, often, they may also be less likely to be able to justify in time and cost the investment of being accredited by these standards. Deputy Presiding Officer, it's certainly positive that we're discussing ensuring that tax is fair and that businesses as well as individuals and other sorts of organisations pay their way. And while bodies like the Fair Tax Foundation are making a positive and useful contribution to the discussion, I would be cautious before applying too great a reliance on these standards and the potential cost that they could create. I'm afraid not. Oh, Mr. Howcroft Johnson That's has it, completed. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, I now call Carol Mochin to be followed by Michelle Thompson. Around four minutes, please, Ms. Mochin. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I thank my colleague Rhoda Grant for bringing this important debate to the Chamber? In the first instance, I refer members to my register of interest as a member of the Cooperative Party. In a week where we have debated the impact of the cost of living crisis, it is only right that we support Fair Trade Week and debate in this chamber the importance of ensuring every company is held firmly to account, as well as note the positive steps taken by the cooperatives and other companies. Deputy Presiding Officer, it has been known for years that powerful corporations and super-rich individuals are exploiting a rigged global system that allows them to avoid paying their fair share of tax. And as always, it is the poorest people in our country, the low-paid workers, who pay the price. We have spent this week in this cham chamber talking about how people in our communities are struggling, struggling to afford necessities such as food and heat. It is appalling that we should need to celebrate companies that pay the correct level of tax in the correct ju jurisdiction at the correct time. It should be the norm, but alas, the actions of the super-rich bring us here today. Extreme economic inequality is being fuelled by an epidemic of tax evasion and avoidance that has reached an unprecedented scale. And so in that context, I thank the Fair Tax Mark for their work in celebrating those companies who do and for making individuals, companies and parliamentarians alike talk about responsible tax conduct. Government should take note that polling by the Fair, Trade, uh, Fair Tax Foundation shows broad public support for the Fair Tax Mark and for a greater interest in tax behaviour. 66% believe that governments and local councils should at least consider a company's ethics and how they pay their tax when letting public contracts. 80% believe that all bus businesses benefiting from government bailouts should have to agree a set of conditions. 
Um, 77 per cent believe that all companies, whatever their size, should have to publicly disclose the taxes that they do or do not pay in the UK. And 74 per cent of the public would rather shop with businesses or work with businesses which can prove that, it's, that it pays its fair share of tax. So part of what we can do is engage with the public and by doing this we can put increased pressure on companies to behave properly and on gov governments globally to reform a broken system. I want to congratulate the co-op movement for its part in achieving the fair tax uh, mark, for highlighting both the practices of tax avoidance and for supporting the Fair Tax Foundation's call to ensure that advanced reform of Scots public procurement rules and allowing con contracting authorities to explicitly reward good tax conduct when awarding public contracts. These businesses must make public commitment to shun avoidance, profit shifting and any artificial presence in tax havens, and that they should make fullest possible financial disclosure and make full as possible disclosure of their beneficial owners um, and persons of significant control. And I hope that the Minister will respond to those points. Also, significantly, um, the, Fa the Fair Tax Foundation has opposition to any efforts by the UK Government to reverse the planned UK corporation tax rate increase, as doing so would further facilitate an international race to the bottom. And surely no one wants to go there. Presiding officer, I thank my colleague Rhoda Grant for bringing this debate to the Chamber and I hope that this debate allows us all to raise this important issue, ensuring that companies in Scotland, in the UK and across the world are held properly to account. Thank you. Thank you. And I now call on Michelle Thompson, uh, who will be the last speaker before I ask the Minister to respond. Uh, around four minutes, please, Ms Thompson. Thank you, presiding officer. Uh, it's a pleasure to take part in this debate and I thank uh, Rhoda Grant for bringing the debate and for her very good speech. I have had an interest in taxation issues for a number of years and not just because I have to pay quite a bit of it. Back in 2016, when an MP, I was a sponsor of a double taxation treaties bill. The bill sought to right some injustices, such as the fact that if African countries were able to access the corporate taxes they were due, the money would exceed the total amount of aid the rest of the world supplies. The bill reached second reading and although not fully picked up in full by the UK government, it did bring some changes. Now, as already highlighted, one of the problems with the UK tax system as a whole is its complexity and large number of loopholes. And of course, there's a huge industry to milk these loopholes, limited resource in government agencies to plug them and limited appetite from the UK government to narrow the tax gap, which stood at 32 billion in year 20 to 2021. I'm reminded of the joke about an accountant's children being told the story of Cinderella and interrupting to ask, but mum, when the pumpkin changed into a golden coach, would that be classed as income or a capital gain? In Scotland, despite our government having very limited powers over taxation, I applaud the efforts the Scottish government has been making to create a fairer and more efficient taxation system in those areas within its control. On rereading Tom Arthur's excellent Reform Scotland blog in June of this year in the government's framework for tax, he explained the need for fairness, transparency and engagement and good guardianship. I suspect these hark back to the four principles of good taxation set out by Adam Smith in 1776. One of these, fairness, and by which Smith meant the ability to pay, appears to be a guiding light for the framework for tax. Similarly, Smith argued for certainty, by which he meant taxpayers should be clearly informed about how and why taxes are being levied. In other words, he argued for what we term transparency today. And again, I note how Tom Arthur's taken forward this concern. He, of course, knows there's considerable scope for improvement and has pointed out that 61% of people in Scotland know very little about the tax system. Transparency and fairness are fundamental to further progress. It's fair to say we're on a journey, but have some way to go before we reach our destination. One further thought is that it's difficult to conceive of any tax that doesn't have unintended consequences. And this is inevitable, as the way in which individuals respond to tax changes may be very different to the intentions of government. And I'm sure we've all seen examples that we can relate to. 
My own concerns about the world we live in includes the growth of shell firms and not least the massive abuse enabled by the existence of Scottish limited partnerships, which despite huge efforts over the years, the UK government, who are responsible for the relevant legislation, have steadfastly refused to reform. So we are making progress, but we have a huge way to go. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you. And I now call in Minister Ivan McKee to respond to the debate. Around seven minutes, please, Minister. Uh, thank you, President Officer, and thanks to Rhoda Grant for bringing this um, very important uh, debate to the Chamber today. And I'd like to thank everybody who's participated uh, and encourage members to continue this conversation because uh, it affects everybody in Scotland. I'd also like to thank the local authorities that have signed up as Fair Tax Councils and to thank the Fair Tax Foundation for the work that they are doing in this regard. And of course, while councils are independent, corporate bodies with their own powers and responsibilities would strongly encourage them to endorse the principles of the Fair Tax Declaration. Fair Tax Week, of course, is a recognition of the businesses paying uh, the correct amount of corporation tax in the correct uh, jurisdiction at the correct time. And of course, across the Chamber, we all agree that our tax system should be fair and that businesses have an ethical obligation to deal openly with their tax affairs and to pay the correct amount of tax. After all, the money we raise through our taxes is spent to benefit people across the country. Um, this debate is not just about the levels of tax uh, individuals and companies are paying, but also the values of our, uh, of our tax system. Um, since the devolution of powers over taxation, the Scottish Government has created a fairer and more progressive approach to the tax system following our distinctive Scottish approach to taxation. And that approach continues to be founded in Adam Smith's four canons of taxation, namely certainty, proportionality, convenience, and efficiency. And another cornerstone of our approach is taking a tough approach to tackling tax avoidance issues. Um, and of, of course, as has been mentioned by Jamie Halker Johnson, the Scottish Government has introduced their own general anti-avoidance rule, um, GAR, um, established by the Revenue Scotland and, and Tax Powers Act 2014. Um, it's wider than the, the corresponding UK GAR because it it's focuses on uh, not just a narrow test of abuse, uh, sorry, it, 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 of uh, abuse rather than uh, the, the wider test of uh, artificiality, which, uh, wh which is what the Scottish GAR covers. And of course, um, during the pandemic, uh, we implemented measures to ensure grants and funds uh, did not go to recipients with uh, links to tax, ha tax havens. And uh, as a consequence of, of, of the Butte House Agreement, we are exploring what, uh, what else we can do in, in, this, uh, in this regard. Um, but it's also important to recognise, of course, that um, taxation, uh, corporate taxation and the issues that go with it are reserved to Westminster and the Scottish Government and therefore is, uh, is constrained in what we can do in this regard, a point well made by Emma Harper, of course, um, there was further devolution or indeed uh, those powers were transferred as a consequence of Scotland becoming a normal independent country. We would be in a position to do much more uh, in that regard than we, uh, we currently are at, uh, at the moment. The Scottish Government, of course, strongly condemns companies and individuals who artificially arrange their affairs to pay less tax. Uh, after all, every penny lost to the uh, tax avoidance is a penny less to be spent helping people and businesses of Scotland at this very difficult time. Um, but uh, of course, those powers uh, lie with UK government and HMRC, um, and we strongly urge them to do more to tackle tax avoidance and evasion. Um, and also, as, as has been highlighted uh, by a number of members, to work internationally to, uh, to, to, for, for cooperation across tax jurisdictions to um, establish processes that allow these issues to be addressed, what are global issues to be addressed in a global, um, global context. The, the points that Michelle Thompson made about the international aspects of this and the impact on, uh, on certain countries in Africa is extremely well made. Um, and also the, the point she makes about the complexity of the UK tax system, which makes progress in many of these areas more, more complicated than it might, uh, and more difficult than it might otherwise, uh, otherwise be. And, and, and I know that Michelle Thompson has a significant interest, not just in uh, good tax practices, but also in wider aspects of uh, corporate governance. And I thank her for the work she takes forward in, uh, in that regard. I want to turn to talk a bit about um, this year procurement, which has been 
mentioned uh, on, on more than one occasion this afternoon. And first of all, to recognise that um, the £14 billion public sector procurement spend in Scotland is something that the Scottish Government and myself as Minister responsible for procurement absolutely recognise as a lever that we can and should use to the full extent to move uh, progress other wider um, social, environmental and, uh, uh, and societal agendas. Um, it's important to recognise that we already use uh, the procurement levers we have with, with, within the constraints that, that exist, because of course we don't uh, control employment law either, um, but we have done significant work to uh, move the, the real living wage agenda, the fair work agenda forward. We've done significant work to, uh, to, to, to support uh, and encourage and shift as much spend as possible towards uh, SMEs within Scotland, something that we've had, uh, we've had significant success in compared to other parts of the UK, and also through the sustainable procurement duty to further the, uh, the, the, the community wealth building agenda. So we are uh, very focused, you can rest assured, on looking to do everything that we can in, uh, in that regard. But of course, it's, um, uh, it's um, um, important to recognise the constraints that we, uh, we operate within, um, within uh, with regards to procurement. Um, the uh, public contracts, uh, Scotland Regulations 2015, already require that public bodies exclude bidders who have been found to have breached their legal obligations in relation to the payment of tax or social security. These also allow public bodies to exclude bidders where they can demonstrate such a breach of legal obligations by any other appropriate means. However, neither the Scottish Parliament or Scottish Ministers have the power to exclude companies from public contracts on the basis of offshore tax planning practices that Westminster allows. Um, and that's an important point to, to recognise because those powers, as I said, um, are uh, are reserved. Um, what I can uh, do, of course, is to continue to um, uh, work with uh, procurement officials uh, and those who are interested in this area to um, explore further opportunities for us to tighten up those, uh, those practices. But as I, I said, it's hugely important to recognise that because those powers aren't devolved, there are uh, restrictions, legal restrictions that uh, limit how far we can go and we're not able to go as far, frankly, as, uh, as we would like in, in that regard. So in conclusion, presiding officer, I think it's been a very um, uh, helpful debate, a very uh, useful debate. It's good to get these issues, these issues raised. I know that my uh, colleague Tom Arthur, whose responsibility for tax, will be, will be watching this very closely um, uh, in this regard as well. Um, and important to recognise that uh, through our Scottish approach to taxation, we're committed to ensuring that uh, individuals and businesses pay the right amount of tax at the right time in the right place. And we're also um, committed, uh, as I've indicated in, in the Butte House Agreement in that regard, uh, to take forward and explore further other measures, any further measures that we can uh, execute in that regard within the limited powers that we do have. Thank you very much, President Officer. Thank you, Minister. And that concludes the debate. And I suspend this meeting until 2.30 p.m. Thank you.